I'm very happy to be able to spend a week uh, with you all and very happy to have a chance to kick things off by um, talking to you a little bit today and then again uh, next Monday uh, about um, a story that I outlined uh, more fully in a recent book that I published called Mind Fixers, uh, which is a book um, that attempts to tell the history of psychiatry's quest to find the biological basis of mental illness. I argue in the book that it's a troubled quest, a frustrated quest, but I also argue that it's a, a quest whose history is important to know because um, in order to understand the troubled and vexed place in which we live today, you need to understand how we got here. Um, and when I say the troubled and vexed uh, place in which we are in, in today, it's um, basically um, my view that there's a lot of confusion uh, about what kind of an entity psychiatry really is, um, especially biological approaches to psychiatry. On the one side, um, it looks like a rigorous clinical practice, no different from any other branch of medicine. It has a growing evidence, uh, evidence base, nuanced differential diagnoses, apparently effective treatments, and maybe breakthroughs just around the corner. Um, but on the other side, um, out in the public arena, we're bombarded with repeated claims from multiple corners that actually none of these claims that psychiatry makes about its own identity are true. Uh, that for today's psychiatry is actually a bad faith world. Its diagnoses are bogus. It's un it has no real understanding about the biological basis of any mental illness. It just pretends it does, say these critics, uh, because it's sold its soul to Big Pharma. Now, both of these understandings of what psychiatry is can't be right, can't be true, at least in the full-throated form that each is generally presented by defenders and critics. But both these understandings of psychiatry exist for a reason. And it would be good to understand what those reasons are. In order, in the course of doing so, to be able to come to a more informed and hopefully less polemical or less defensive understanding of what kind of an enterprise today's biological psychiatry really is. So this is what I'm going to try to do uh, in the two lectures that I've been invited to give to all of you today and next Monday. Try to help us understand our current moment in biological psychiatry by talking about how it really came to be. And to do that work, I want to start by focusing on a period in American psychiatry that deserves a lot more attention than I think it often gets, the 1980s because this was the decade when, by common consensus, we see a remarkably rapid pivot away from everything that psychiatry used to think it was all about, the psychoanalytic, the psychosocial, um, the psychotherapeutic, uh, and towards the so-called medical model that foregrounded biology and the brain. Why does this happen in the 1980s? Why then? So if you asked people in the time what was going on, the argument that you'll see being made again and again is that this is happening. This, the revolution in biology is being declared because after years of bad theory, sloppy diagnostics, fanciful Freudian uh, treatments, uh, finally some good biological research had come along some diagnostic housekeeping had come along that immediately made clear that the Freudian dinosaurs had to go. So this is an excerpt. I'm not allowed to step out of the light. I got, uh, maybe I can come this far. I was given instructions. Um, but this is an excerpt uh, from a Pulitzer Prize winning series of uh, newspaper reports on the biological revolution of psychiatry by a man named John Franklin. Came out in 1984. Look at the way he talks about what was going on. And look particularly at the way he talks about the Freudians. He uses words like witchcraft, bumbling, humorous stepchild of modern science. And then looks at the way he talks about the people who are taking over. 
the research psychiatrists in their labor laboratories, dissecting the brains, chemical formulas, secrets of the mind, finally all paying off. So this idea that the 1980s was the decade when these biologically minded scientists rode in on their white horses to throw the Freudians out of Dodge City um, is a really good story. It's a story that's had a lot of staying power. It's a story that shows up in a lot of textbooks that psychiatric residents and medical students read to this day. And here's some from some recent um, books. This is from an encyclopedia. This is from a textbook telling versions of this story again. What do they mention? Medical technology, computer revolution, neuroimaging, genetics research, psychopharmacology. The psychoanalytic period was a pseudoscience inexplicably dominated the field, and finally we were able to return, uh, reclaim the scientific status of the field again. It's a really good story. The problem with the story is that it's wrong. And a moment's consideration should make clear to us it has to be wrong. Because if it were really the whole story, then we wouldn't today be so confused and conflicted about what kind of an enterprise psychiatry really is. So there has to be more to say. And there is. So let me tell you what I think really happened. And to do this, I'm going to need to take us back before the 1980s and actually to the period just before the Second World War. Because in this period, American psychiatry was an eclectic patchwork of practices and perspectives that some of which were biological, some of which were more environmental. And in this period, the biological psychiatrists were mostly based in state hospitals uh, and had a thoroughly respectable place in the patchwork of activities that the field did. They worked uh, in these hospitals. The hospitals were generally overcrowded, underfunded. They worked with the most seriously mentally ill. Um, for decades, the view had been that nothing could really be done to help these most seriously mentally ill patients, but that view had just recently changed in the 1930s. There were a series, and you're looking here at a series of newspaper articles celebrating a whole set of new physical treatments that have been introduced in rapid succession starting in the late 1920s through the middle years of the 1930s many of which have been pretty much forgotten today, but which at the time were celebrated as finally offering hope to people whose prospects had up to this point in time been seen as hopeless. So take a look. Did you know that a, the first Nobel Prize in psychiatry, and by some reckonings the only Nobel Prize in psychiatry, was given to this man, Julius Wagner Jorig, for a treatment that is today pretty much forgotten called malaria fever treatment for a disorder that's pretty much forgotten, called general paralysis of the insane. Who's ever heard of malaria fever treatment? I'm surprised anybody. And general paralysis of, of the insane, uh, at that point in time, invariably fatal disorder, degenerative fatal disorder, today understood to be a late stage of neurosyphilis, today treated with antibiotics. Um, at that point, um, people died invariably. Um, and he was able to get a more or less a 25% success rate treatment cure, cure rate uh, with this treatment, and he wins a Nobel Prize for it. Uh, also pretty much forgotten insulin shock therapy. Who's heard of that? More. What do you know about it? Uh, it yes, it was similar to electroshock, uh, except that it used insulin, which was the new wonder drug of the, of the moment. Um, and it used in, by give, and it gave particularly schizophrenic patients uh, very high doses of insulin till they reach till they would convulse and, and then fall into a coma, and then be pulled out of the coma by being given a glucose injection or orange juice, uh, and according to those who believed in the treatment, would wake up often much more lucid. Uh, electroshock you mentioned. Uh, the only uh, treatment from this period that's still used today, originally also used. Uh, on schizophrenic patients until it was discovered by chance that it actually was more effective for patients with major depression, and for that it's, of course, still used today. Uh, even lobotomies, um, 
which are today remembered as among the most barbaric uh, and ill-considered technologies ever employed in the history of psychiatry, were discussed in pretty optimistic terms back in the 1930s. And these are just a sample of the ways that biological psychiatry in the 1930s was understood. But alongside these biological psychiatrists existed a, another branch of American psychiatry, working largely outside the hospital system, and working particularly with a population of patients um, that were not actually mentally ill, but were believed to be at risk of, being, of becoming mentally ill. Uh, people who were nearly normal, but who had problems. There were a lot of ways that people talked about these people with problems. Um, they were maladjusted, or they were troubled. They maybe had deficient personalities. Uh, they were neurotic, or maybe they were just nervous. Uh, but this other branch of psychiatry, working at the same period as the biological psychiatrists, um, attempted to salvage, identify, salvage, and uh, protect this population from succumbing to more serious disorders uh, by inventing a whole new range of institutions and programs. Um, new professions like psychiatric social work were invented in this period. Uh, new institutions like child guidance centers were invented in this period. Um, new kinds of social interventions and curriculum. So here you're seeing a bunch of all these things that were products also of the 1930s. Here's a child gui guidance center, uh, a social worker talking to the mother of this child. Here's a psychopathic center called the Lafargue uh, Institute out in Harlem in the 1940s. Um, here's some of the, this is a, a poster from an early exhibition in about 1923. Juvenile, they're interested in juvenile delinquency. Here's their journal, and so on. By the 1930s, a lot of the psychiatrists who were involved in this other branch of psychiatry's work had discovered psychoanalysis, uh, were incorporating Freudian ideas about the unconscious and fantasy and early trauma into the ways they thought about their patients. Uh, but through the 1920s and 30s, these two prongs of psychiatry more or less coexisted, even if a little bit uneasily. And their coexistence was helped a lot by the fact that the now forgotten, but at that point enormously influential doyen of American psychiatry, a man named Adolf Meyer, um, insisted that there was a place for both. He worked tirelessly to encourage the development of both of these traditions. Both approaches had their appropriate place. And then World War II came along. And it was the psychiatrists with the expertise in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, not the biologically oriented psychiatrists, who primarily stepped up. Their tools seemed much better suited for helping the traumatized soldiers than anything that the biological psychiatrists had to offer. Uh, and so after the war is over, they kind of self-presented as the heroes the ones who had helped win the war. And after the war was over, Adolf Meyer was getting old, he'd retired, his influence had waned, uh, and the leadership within these Freudian-leaning psychiatrists who had helped to win the Second World War were less inclined to return back to the kind of conciliatory place for both of us uh, in this eclectic world of American psychiatry that they had agreed to um, in the past. They now took the position uh, that because they had helped win the war, it was they and not the biological folk who now needed to win the peace. There were urgent mental health needs of the post-World War world. Helping and healing a troubled world, helping citizens learn to live in a troubled world, uh, helping to heal not just the seriously mentally ill, but you, and me, all of us, the American public, that was the mission of post-war American psychiatry. And in these anxious early years of the Cold War, these post-war Freudians were remarkably successful in winning the ear, in persuading the public and persuading the government to turn to them not the biologists. 
as their guide. So they're seeing the face of a man named William Menninger. This is, of course, a 1948 cover of Time magazine. William Menninger had led the military effort to deal with the trauma traumatized soldiers during the Second World War. He then had returned to become president of the American Psychiatric Association, and now almost literally he was becoming the face of American psychiatry. With these keys, as you can see here, ironically with a brain there, but um, that could unlock the secrets of our troubled age. And look here at this quote. Look who it's from, first of all. President Truman, speaking to the, in the opening of the 1948 me May meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. Now, what is he saying? The Cold War age needed sanity, needed to safeguard sanity on all levels. And now it was the job of American psychiatry to safeguard the sanity of American society. This does not sound much like a medical project, but it suited the mood of the moment. And so the Freudian star begins to rise. And as chance would have it, the star of the biological psychiatrists in these same years begin to dim. The Nuremberg trials, the reports of atrocities by Nazi doctors, experiments, and murders that have been carried out on psychiatric patients believed to suffer from incurable biological disorders, had the effect of making it close to taboo to express any kind of interest in genetic approaches to mental disorders for decades. At the same time, there were some wartime revelations that were spearheaded by various conscientious objectors who had worked in the state mental hospital system during the Second World War, uh, unmasking the appalling conditions uh, prevailing in most of the state mental hospitals. This was a um, very influential article called Bedlam 1946, appeared in Life magazine. You can read, I won't read all these things on the, scre on the screen, but you can, um, you can look at them. But notice these images, maybe just for a minute. Do they remind you of anything? Prison. Prison. Hol so they, that, the, hol the, what they would have reminded people in 1946 of images that had been seared into their memory just recently of concentration camps. And that was by design. We had just fought a war to free the world of Nazism and the Holocaust, and what were we discovering lived and existed in our own borders. And the biological psychiatrist's reputation suffered in the wake of this, these kinds of revelations, since most of them worked in these hospitals, even ran these hospitals. And then as the Freudians gain an influence, some of these men went to the trouble of attacking those treatments within biological psychiatry that just a decade earlier had been seen as finally offering hope to the most severely mentally ill, the shock treatments, the surgical treatments. Uh, what these Freudians do, and this is from a group called the Group for the Advancement of Psychiatry that saw itself as a reformist movement within psychiatry, headed by William Menninger, founded by William Menninger. Um, Making clear, this was their very first report was on shock therapy. What are they saying? Reported promiscuous and indiscriminate use of, cycle of, shock, of electroshock therapy. We need to devote a, um, evaluate, we need to evaluate the role of this therapy, look at the extravagant claims about its efficacy, and so on and so on. It was crude, it was mechanistic, it was a relic of an outmoded era. Maybe it was necessary in some unavoidable cases, but it was far, far inferior to psychotherapy, now the queen, the queen of the treatments of psychiatry and social interventions. So given all this, this change in the fortunes of these two branches of psychiatry, it's probably now hardly surprising uh, when, to that, that when I tell you that in 1946, when the American federal government under Truman 
makes its first ever commitment at a federal level to invest in mental health, this social activist, psychoanalytically or oriented branch of psychiatry benefits disproportionately from the resources that are released. The NIMH, established in the late 1940s, today we think of the NIMH as a deeply medically um, grounded, biologically oriented institution. That's not how it began. Um, it began headed by a psychoanalyst named Robert Felix, um, who set an agenda in which he would uh, the research grants that the NIMH gave out would overwhelmingly privilege projects in psychology, in psychotherapy, in social science, and very slim pickings for more conventional medical projects. And this persisted right through the 1970s. Right through the 1970s, the NIMH was an organization that focused on things like child and family mental health, like suicide, crime, delinquency, poverty, violence, racism, social problems not what we think of as medical problems. The NIMH also made a decision to disproportionately give its training grants, not to state hospital systems or laboratories, but to psychologically oriented institutes like this one, the Menninger School of Psychiatry out in Topeka, Kansas. For years, there was a highway sign outside of Topeka, Kansas that said, welcome to Topeka, Kansas, the psychiatric capital of the world. <laughs> and this was because for years, this institute trained as many as 10% of America's psychiatrists. But even as they're now out of favor, under siege, beleaguered, of course there are still biological psychiatrists out there. They hang on. And actually, they do more than just hang on. Ironically, the so-called Freudian era that everyone loves to sort of bash uh, when they imagine the biologists taking over, this, the so-called Freudian years were actually turn out from a purely scientific perspective to have been some of their quietly most productive years as well. All the major classes of drugs that to this day we still conjure with, the antipsychotics, as we now call them, the, anti, the anxiolytics, the antidepressants, they're products of the 50s. Corpromazine, you see here under a brand name Thorazine. This is the first one. It's approved uh, as a treatment for schizophrenia in 1954. This is actually not meprobamate, uh, but there were a series of uh, anti-anxiety medications. Meprobamate was the first one under, sold under the brand name Milltown. Has anyone ever heard of Milltown? Again, this is a, this is a generational thing uh, of people. Uh, it would be replaced by Valium really in the 70s as a you know, stronger, better, shorter half-life alternative. Uh, the antidepressants on the market by 1958. Psychopharmacology as a field is essentially invented in these years. Though what it meant to be a psychopharmacologist in this period was initially kind of unclear because at this time, no one had any idea why patients would become less psychotic or less anxious simply because they'd swallowed the pill. And what many people assumed is that these drugs tranquilized. They tranquilized anxious or psychotic patients, or maybe they energized depressed patients. But they didn't affect the underlying disorder. These weren't curative medications, was the assumption. And this, because of this, uh, this meant that the practical effects of the success of these new drugs, and they were very successful, they were immediately taken up. The practical success of these drugs was far less destabilizing to the Freudian orthodoxy of this time than you might otherwise think. It was possible to see these drugs as useful tools for managing all these symptoms, and still suppose that the disorder that they were treating had its origins in childhood trauma, in unconscious conflicts, and things like that, and all of which could only be actually cured with psychotherapy. And you can see how they're talking about this here. 
you add the drug treatment with psychotherapy and the, so that the psychotherapy can do its work. And you can see the way that they're talking, all looking, advertising also these drugs in this time, emphasizing anxiety, emphasizing this is in this you know, poor psychotic man's unconscious, this giant eye, the terror. Let's tranquilize him so that we can get him to stabilize it sufficient, sufficiently that he's not terrified out of his mind and maybe we can then do something more for him. So the drug that would start to change the conversation about how to think about mental disorders, drugs, and their relationship was actually not any of these new psychiatric medications. And you're seeing what it was. It was LSD. This is a drug that we today associate with a very different kind of social history, a drug whose central role in actually launching psychopharmacology as a field is kind of often a little bit suppressed, a little bit passed over, a little seen as a little bit embarrassing, but nevertheless, the facts are the facts. And the reason it becomes central to launching psychopharmacology as a research enterprise is that in the 1950s, before the word psychedelic had been invented and all the social history that we know better had started up in earnest, it was generally believed that LSD was a drug that made people temporarily schizophrenic. It was sold on, as an experimental drug under the uh, brand name Delicid by Sandoz, in a Swiss-based um, pharmaceutical company. Uh, but they started using it in the United States starting in 1949, I think. Max Rinkle out at Harvard was the first uh, researcher to, to want it. And this was his boss, Milton Greenblatt, saying, we were very interested in anything that could make someone schizophrenic. Why were they very interested? Well, initially, it didn't have anything to do uh, with biology or biochemistry. Um, it had to do with the fact that it offered the prospect of studying in a controlled way the inner world of a psychotic experience. The view was that you would get your subject to take the drug. You then give the subject a range of psychological tests and structured interviews, uh, and you would watch the changes over time. Uh, so here's a very rare and pretty, um, you know, from a kind of tabloidy uh, magazine, uh, article about one of these experiments. They're hard to find because they were not widely published, and part of the reason has to do with CIA funding and other things that I'm not going to really get distracted by. We can come back to if you're interested. Uh, I went insane for science. Um, look how he's talking uh, about how he expects the drug to cast light on his deep on frustrated desires, evil wishes, and subconscious tortures, his deep unconscious fantasies. And then how he ends up taking a Rorschach test, which was a psychoanalytic test uh, that was intent, a project, so-called projection test designed to reveal people's unconscious conflicts. And he gives a so-called schizophrenic response to the Rorschach test. And just to underscore how far we are today from our own world, um, this man, um, Dr. Carl Pfeiffer of Emory University was not a psychoanalyst. When he did this experiment, he was actually chair of the pharmacology department at Emory University. Even psychopharmacologists in those days lived at least partially in a Freudian world. But then, even as all this work was going on, something happened whose significance would only become clearer a bit later, um, a 25-year-old junior researcher, a woman, very unusual in this time, named Betty Tuareg, discovered to the great surprise of her advisor um, that a chemical, previously of interest for its potential role in, play, in, in hypertension, uh, but recently named serotonin, uh, which had only been thought to exist in the gastrointestinal systems of mammals, um, actually could also be found in mammalian brains. She'd asked to look. He hadn't believed anything would be found, but he gave her a lab. He gave her a chance to do it, and she found it. Now, this is a time when neurochemistry barely existed as a field, and this was a really, therefore, a really big deal because it raised the possibility that this chemical, 
that people now started to call a neurohormone, that we don't start hearing about neurotransmitters until the 1970s, really. Uh, a neurohormone um, might play some kind of role in brain functioning. But what? What might it be doing? No one, any, no one really had any idea. Until a couple of people noticed that serotonin had a chemical structure that was quite similar to LSD. And LSD was, of course, the most powerful mind-altering drug that science had ever discovered. And this fact raised a really intriguing possibility. Maybe these close structural similarities between LSD and serotonin meant that the LSD molecules when you take LSD, interfere with the normal functioning of the serotonin model. Because, for example, maybe they attach themselves to parts of the nerve that serotonin would normally attach itself to, so it blocks serotonin's ability to have its normal effect on the brain. And if this was, in fact, happening, maybe this is why LSD made people crazy. And maybe, this is also why people with schizophrenia are crazy. Maybe serotonin is essential for sanity. And here he's talking about Dilworth Woolley and Shaw in 1954, sort of making the argument and suggesting that if it's true, then we just need to treat people uh, with the appropriate mental disorders with serotonin. Well, the suggestion raised a lot of interest. And um, some researchers out at the NIH thought that they might be able to test it. And here's how they did it. They took laboratory animals like dogs and rabbits, and they injected them with a drug that we don't, again, know very much about anymore, uh, called Resterpine. This was a drug that had been briefly used as a treatment for schizophrenia in the 1950s and early 60s. It was never really that good. Um, so it didn't really have the star power of Thorazine and Haldol. Um, but it was also known in those years to be an effective way to block or reverse an LSD psychosis. And no one had known why it was able to do this, but now they have an hypothesis. If LSD did make people crazy by interfering with serotonin absorption, then Resterpine's ability to reverse LSD psychosis must lie in its ability somehow to neutralize that interference. And the hypothesis was that we did this by elevating serotonin levels in the brain. So they give the drug to the rabbits and the dogs, but these are actual rabbits who have been injected with resterpine. I couldn't find any dogs. Uh, what do you think happened? What do you think? We'll get to that. Not only did resorpine fail to elevate serotonin levels in these laboratory animals, it did the reverse. It caused these animals to have been injected with the drug to dump most of their stores of serotonin, and it was now also found norepinephrine, another neurohormone recently of interest. Um, but in the course of failing to figure out why LSD makes people crazy, the the, the, these researchers accidentally discovered something else they, that some, one of you just noticed. Uh, they found that recipient, in addition to having the effect of reducing levels of serotonin in these animals' bodies, also caused them to sink into a state of lethargy, like you see here. And some thought that this lethargy looked a lot like, um, a, well, at least was a fair imitation of human depression. So suddenly attention turns from schizophrenia and LSD to depression and its drugs. And you can guess what happens next. They give recipient to laboratory animals again. They let them fall into a state of lethargy. And then they inject them with antidepressants. And guess what happens next? There were two. 
uh, there, were, there were two kinds of antidepressants they had. They had the MAOIs, uh, which didn't have a very long uh, market life because they turned, uh, they're still very occasionally used, but um, they turned out to have a lot of side effects and a lot of risks um, associated with them. They were much more dangerous. Uh, the tricyclics, which were discovered pretty much at the same point in time, were the ones that were being largely used by this point in time. And that actually still provide the template for antidepressants today. Tricyclic. <coughs> uh, so, but both of them had the, both of them did the MAOIs and the tricyclics had the same effect. They increased the serotonin and norepinephrine levels in these animals whose serotonin and norepinephrine levels had been artificially depleted. And the animals perked right back up. They started to act normally again. It took a long time to figure out the mechanisms whereby this worked. You're seeing a picture here of Julius Axelrod, uh, a name that if you don't know, it's worth knowing. He wins a Nobel Prize for his elegant work that clarifies the role that um, the so-called reuptake inhibitors uh, play in the, um, as a mechanism of antidepressant, what the ways in which the antidepressants work. Um, but the fact that the drugs all through the levels of these brain chemicals was clear from the outset. Now, a rabbit who's been injected with reserpine and become lethargic and then perked up when it's been given antidepressants is not a human patient suffering from clinical depression. But it was, of course, known that depressed patients often also improved after taking antidepressants. So the question was, well, is it possible that this happens because depressed patients have naturally existing, as opposed to drug-induced, low levels of serotonin and norepinephrine that the antidepressants then correct? This is the theory that all of us have heard, the so-called chemical imbalance of depression. It's a consequence of this work of the late 1950s and early 60s on animal, using this animal model of depression. And people did ask this question in the early 60s, um, but everyone knew it was just a hypothesis. It was just a heuristic. It was just an idea worth thinking about. The gap between the animal work and the human clinical situation, everyone knew, was really big. Nothing had been proven. And so even with this work, as well as this other work I don't have time to get into about dopamine and its possible role in schizophrenia, even with all this, no one back in the 60s stood up and declared a biological revolution. The best science of the era, and in that period, nobody was imprudent enough to stand up and say, out with the Freudians, in with us. Instead, the Freudians stay in charge. Their projects go roaring ahead. They worry about bad mothers. Uh, they insist that all kinds of illnesses, including s serious mental disorders like schizophrenia, have their roots in childhood trauma, conflicts, bad parenting. Uh, they're concerned about bad neighborhoods. They're concerned about bad families. They have things to say about juvenile delinquents, about racism, about war, and deinstitutionalization the most audacious public policy around the seriously mentally ill in a century, the emptying out and closing down or drastic shrinking of the state mental hospital system happens under their watch. Because the state mental hospitals the post-World War period had shown were a disgrace. And the community now would embrace these individuals. And here you see Kennedy talking about this. So these are bold, heady years for the Freudians. But it turns out that they were also fragile years for them. By the early 1970s, you already see trouble starting to brew. They had come out of the Second World War heroes, but in the early 1970s, uh, they're vilified for helping the military fight a different war, a much less popular war, the Vietnam War, um, and accused of failing to support all the young soldiers who were damaged by that war. 
They're accused also of using psychoanalytic theory to cover up the scandalous truth of childhood sexual abuse, of incest, a radicalized gay community, um, insist that they're sick and tired of having their right to love who they want turned into a sign of disease. A whole bunch of different kinds of critics, uh, some of them associated with a movement that has since sometimes been called anti-psychiatry, uh, accuse them, sometimes quite persuasively, of not caring about diagnostics. And it's actually true, they really didn't. And actually having no reliable and objective way of distinguishing between sanity and insanity. And when the recession hits the US in the early mid to mid 1970s, insurance companies start asking, well, why should we reimburse these people if they can't tell the difference between insanity and insanity, between sanity and insanity, if they don't even know who's really sick? And finally, and in some sense most consequentially, their bold and certainly initially very idealistic vision that they would cl of closing down the mental hospitals and releasing all of these severely mentally ill patients back into the so-called community badly backfired. It's true that the hospitals began to drastically shrink. Um, California, to its shame, I would say, you know, played a leading role uh, on fiscal rather than ideological grounds in driving that movement under Reagan, under gov then Governor Reagan. Uh, but the big picture here is simply that chronically mentally ill patients were released into the so-called communities, but those communities turned out to not really want them and to not have the resources to care for them. So many mentally ill patients who had previously lived in hospitals now started living in for-profit boarding houses uh, with little care. Um, or they ended up living on the streets, or they ended up in jail. It's still a problem, a serious problem today. Or if they were lucky, they ended back living with their aging parents. Their parents who were overwhelmed by their needs, who felt betrayed by the system, and who were desperate for better care and resources. And here you just see some of the articles, but this one I'll call your attention to particularly. Schizophrenia's victims now includes strained families. Families become the doctors. The greatest number of schizophrenics do not now live in hospitals or in the streets or jails, but rather with their families, representing a profound change in the way the nation cares for its most severely mentally ill. So now as the storms whip around psychiatry, this, the out of power biological wing sense an opportunity. And I think, in a sense, also sense of feeling of, of responsibility to step up. There was a sense enough is enough. The field had gotten itself into a state of crisis, was on the brink of collapse in terms of its reputation by being both unscientific and grandiosely hubristic about what the field could do. It was now time to get back to brass tacks. It was time to get back to being medical. It was time for them to be in charge. And how did they make their case? When you look carefully at what they're saying in this period, what becomes clear is that they're not arguing, in spite of what the textbooks are later going to say, they're not arguing for change because there have been any new revolutionary breakthroughs on the scientific front, because there hadn't been. They do gesture to the research from the 1950s and 1960s. They're as hopeful signs. But they don't suddenly find revolutionary significance in that work, at least if they're honest brokers, uh, because the work hadn't been revolutionary. Instead, their campaign is largely waged on a platform of common sense. Of course, psychiatry is a medical profession. Of course, mental illnesses are real diseases. Of course, there's a real biology here. Of course, diagnosis is important. Take a look at what manifestos like this one you're seeing here from Gerald Clareman uh, feel compelled to say. 
they actually feel compelled to say psychiatry is a branch of medicine. Can you imagine a cardiologist saying cardiology is a branch of medicine? You couldn't imagine it. But a psychiatrist in 1978 feels he has to start that way. And that it should use science. And that it actually treats people who are sick. And that there's a difference between being sick and being normal. And so on and so on. So they pen manifestos like these. They start to talk to journalists like John Franklin, the guy who wrote the Pulitzer Prize winning series of articles that I started off with and told and made their case to him. Uh, they start publishing articles of their own. Um, they start talking about biochemistry, about science, about drugs in a different way than the Freudians had done, saying that they worked because they tackled a biological problem. And as they begin talking this way, they find allies. And their most important, their most consequential ally are the families of these schizophrenic patients. Families who have been lived through the trauma of deinstitutionalization and who at the same time have been told by the Freudians that they, who now had responsibility for the care of their children, were actually responsible for having made their children crazy in the first place. They started off desperate and frightened, and eventually they get angry and they get organized. And they build alliances with biological psychiatrists, including new biological psychiatrists in the NIMH, who are looking to make change there. Um, these biological psychiatrists tell them schizophrenia is a biological disorder. It's no one's fault, especially it's not your fault. They embrace this message, but they do something more. They turn themselves into the most powerful public lobby, lobbying group that the field had ever seen. It comes to be known as NAMI, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. It embarks on a stunningly successful media fundraising and government pressure campaign to redirect the field towards biological understandings of serious mental illnesses. The Freudians had betrayed these people, first by blaming them and then by dumping their kids out on the sidewalks. The biologists claimed to offer them hope, hope of new treatments, hope of better understandings, and also a hope of being absolved as parents. The biological psychiatrists had become the new good guys. The ones who, unlike the Freudians, put the suffering of patients and their families ahead of ideology and victim blaming. And so it came that biologists win the day. You're looking here at a picture of Robert Spitzer who spearheaded the so-called third revision of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM-3. Initially, this was going to be a kind of humdrum project to just revise the manual in the ways that the previous two revisions had um, done. But sensing the mood of the moment, uh, they turned the revision into an opportunity to expunge virtually all of the psychoanalytic language and concepts from the universe of psychiatry's illnesses and replace them with a series of proposed disorders that would be now diagnosed using checklists of symptoms and whose actual biological causes everyone now hoped could be you know, just a way to discovery. Four years later, the psychiatrist Nancy Andreasen, with whom I've had a number of interesting conversations since uh, Mind Fixers came out a few months ago, published a book called The Broken Brain, The Biological Revolution in Psychiatry, in which she told her readers that everything they thought they knew about mental illness had been radically turned on its head. Freud was out, biology was in, psychiatry had re-embraced its medical mission, and no one should mourn the passing of the psychoanalytic era because these new biological perspectives that were now coming into being would not only open the door to more effective treatments, but to a more humane and compassionate approach to mental illness.
But as I now wrap up the first part of my two-part story with this feel-good moment, this moment of hope, this moment of optimism, let me just remind you of a few things. The biological psychiatrist had declared victory. But unknown to most of the general public at the time, and even for many years after, they'd done so in the absence of any new radical breakthroughs in biological understanding. These hypotheses linking depression and schizophrenia to deficits and excesses in a small number of neurotransmitters, they were now 25 years old. Every honest broker in the field knew that they had a lot of problems, that at best they were very, very partial understandings of these disorders. Genetics research, slowly starting up again, hadn't really yielded anything decisive and certainly not anything that helped patients or that made a difference to patients. Treatment hadn't advanced. Psychiatrists were still relying on the same classes of drugs that had been developed in the 1950s. Nothing radically new had emerged in more than a generation. And yet they had declared victory. So if they were now going to keep their revolutionary promises to the public, they had their work cut out for them. So how would things go? Next week, I will come back <laughs> and tell you what happens next. Thank you very much.